guitar. Benji was here pretty much the whole time. Joel came in kind of on the last two days to, uh, to knock his parts out, but it was a very businesslike thing. I mean, people would do their stuff, they'd be done with it, out they would go. It wasn't a matter at that point of being like a gang. Maybe younger bands do that, because I see people in here all the time who feel like they have to be a part of the thing the whole time to get every bit out of it. These guys already came in with a very seasoned veteran uh, um, attitude towards the whole thing where they got their stuff done and then they had other business to take care of. And again, because it was in the middle of a tour, there, there just was no time to waste. They had to do too many things while they were here because they had a lot of people tugging at them. You know, their careers were really beginning to take off, so they were learning very quickly that you had to guard yourselves and be done with the, th the tasks of the day and then go on and try and get more things done. It wasn't about rest and relaxation by any stretch. When we were working on the vocals, um, I let Benji completely drive the situation. He was the one who was calling the shots and Joel did predominantly most of the singing because Benji was still playing a fair amount of guitar back then. While we were working on the vocal takes, they do have the same character vocal-wise, but there is a distinct difference in that Joel will deliver stuff in a certain way from Benji. Benji's always a little more rough around the edges. Joel's a little more polished. So when we were working on the vocal parts, Joel would sing a line or two, and Benji would say, now nah, you could do it this way, and they would do it again. Or, hey, you could try it this way. And they would speak in, I guess Billy calls it the twin language. They would speak in the twin language, and then immediately they would know what was going on, and boom, it would be done quick. I mean, some of these songs we did four and five part harmonies, and they just knocked them out super fast. Try this, this, and this. Boom, boom, boom. We do that. And again, because of the time constraints, we really couldn't mess around with um, getting too many alternative takes. But we would just knock the parts out bit by bit, and then the songs would come to life. And it was, it was really enjoyable because even though they had already just done one record, granted they did it in the big level in L.A., they had learned very quickly what you need to go after to get at the essence of the performance real fast. So because of that, like I said, we were able to cover a lot of ground in a very short period of time. Four days to do four songs is raging fast. Absolutely. Having made a running start from their first album and with an ever increasing fan base gain from their extensive touring, Good Charlotte now went into the studio to record their follow up album, The Young and the Hopeless. It would prove to be a massive success. That just was off the charts. I and mean, that thing blew up bigger and better than anything. And I think that any one of them and myself and probably anyone at the label originally expected. I mean, the sounds, I remember sitting in a car with Benji when he came back into town and uh, he was in a rental car and he had some of the burnt tracks from what, uh, from their recent recordings, not fully mastered, but mastered well enough. And just, I just, I knew when I heard some of that stuff that it was going to be just one of the next big things. And then lo and behold, it was. Um, with you know songs such as Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, the anthem, and so on. I was just like, wow, you know, this is. I mean, just watching that blow up, you know, after they had their show on MTV and stuff, it was just watching that just have take on a life of its own was really amazing, you know. And they always do these kind of big, overwrought intros, and I always used to go, what is this intro? You know, I used to mess with them. What are you doing? What what is this this, this instrumental intro? It's so funny sounding. And hey, I'm a bit of a cynic, you know, and, and I'll always give them a hard time. But when I saw them on their second album, I, fi I finally got to see them play a real show. You know, they'd always tried to, you know, get me to come out and see them play, and I was always playing. Well, one day I, I finally didn't have a show, and I could go see them play. And this banner dropped down, and I hear this intro, and this place is sold out, and all these kids are screaming bloody murder, and I'm just like, now those intros make sense to me on the record. Eric Valentine had just done the Smash Mouth record, so he had his stuff was way big blowing up. So the band had hooked up with him because they wanted to bring other elements into their record. Because I talked to Billy about this is how I know this. Like he brought in kind of like Danny Elfman-esque intros, and Billy and some of the members of the band were into like the Tim Burton kind of look and things like that. So they wanted that folded into their second record. And at that point, they had really caught their stride about what their audience was really wanting to hear. So they were really good at, at, at paring the songs down, at making them straight to the point. They also learned that from Don. So then that way, they could really get it to where people could latch on and identify with what was going on. The other thing is that they had become to become embraced by the, um, the L.A. quote unquote punk rock scene. So they started showing up in other people's videos, which made you know, their cred get higher and higher. And they started getting more tattoos. 
I mean, I remember the first time they came in here, they had like one or two tattoos each. Then the next time they came in, they had like, they were getting the sleeves thing going. And then the last time I met them, it's like full on. And then I had produced other records with Billy in the meantime with bands from up in the Northeast, where he would come in and every week he'd have something new. And it was like, wow, they were becoming established more as entertainers. So they were getting an idea of, of what the role really was about. Whilst there have been changes to the band lineup over the years, notably the drummer position, the core of Good Charlotte has always remained the same, the Madden twins, Paul Thomas and Billy Martin. And whilst much of the publicity around the band tends to focus on twins Benji and Joel, each of the four core members has proven to be a vital component in the band's success. You know, Benji and Joel are, are really the main part of Good Charlotte. Um, you know, obviously the, the bass player Paul and Billy coming in um, definitely rounded off the band. Um, but, you know, I could tell early on that Benji and Joel were the driving force. They wrote all the songs. They really had in their head the way they wanted everything to sound. So I think from their standpoint, it was really just associating themselves with other musicians that felt the same way they did. And um, I think Paul and Billy were those, were, those, were those musicians. And, you know, Billy's an amazing guitarist. Paul's an amazing bassist. And I think it was, it was easy for the band to succeed with that makeup. Billy uh, is still one of the greatest guys I've ever met. Benji and Joel still are, and Paul. I mean, they're people that, uh, you know, they don't booze it up. Um, they don't do drugs, they never have, and especially on tour. I mean, uh, you know, I've had a beer with a few of the guys, you know, like Benji and Joel before, um, you know, when uh, they're not on tour. But uh, it, they're, they're not booze hounds, they don't drink it up, they don't live that typical rock star life. And actually today I was reading a thing in Men's Fitness uh, about you know all the the uh, different rock stars people like from Maroon 5 and uh, Chris Cornell and so on just speaking about how those people had uh, you know the, back then the, the rock star attitude the new rock star attitude is now live live a clean healthy life and basically respect the people around you don't burn your bridges and the guys have always lived that way all four of them it's part of their upbringing too the way that they were brought up uh, with the spiritual background but also, I think when you're twins, you just you have each other, you know? You can rely on each other. They have that give and take with each other, Benji and Joel do.